Hey everyone! It is LGBT History Month and I am so excited because I'm going live with David Hayward, the Naked Pastor. He's gonna be joining us any minute. So excited! Um, so in celebration of LGBT History Month, my book club, Read with Jewels, is going through Unclobber by Colby Martin. And this whole month, what we're doing this whole month is interviewing different leaders, um, educators, and people within the LGBTQ community and um, talking about rethinking our misuse of the Bible on homosexuality. So we are going to be talking in just a second with the Naked Pastor. And I'm very excited. Let's see if I can invite him. Hi, everyone. <laughs> hello, hello. Let me see. You should have your request. Hi. Hi. <laughs> oh my goodness, yay. <laughs> it worked. I'm so thrilled to see you. Good to see you too. Oh. I just love you. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I do so much. <laughs> you fill my life with happiness and color, so it's just wonderful. Thank you so much. I am so thrilled that you agreed to come and talk with me. I'm like so super honored. Oh man. Wow. Well, I'm honored and humbled. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Okay, everyone. David Hayward, the naked pastor. <laughs> yeah, that's me. <laughs> I know. Our communities collide. So I was just yes. like, um, it's LGBT History Month. So I wanted to have different leaders within the community, educators, and you, David, have become like a natural kind of leader in within the LGBTQ community and faith. And so where those inner connect and that's really what we're talking about because i'm taking my book club through unclobber yeah the use of the bible on homosexuality so that's what i want to talk to you about because you yeah. are you have a, a very rich pedigree as it concerns religion um mm -hmm. you received your bachelor's in bible your master's in bible then your diploma in ministry am i correct yep yep so what, first of all, what made you want to study the Bible? I love the Bible. Yeah, I love the Bible. Like I, I, um, I remember as a teenager, just, I still have it actually, my interlinear Bible uh, with pencil crayon and writing in the margins and uh, all my notes. And I, I really grew up on it. And so I wanted to uh, understand it more and more. So I went and got my bachelor's, as you say, in, in Bible and theology. And then the same with uh, New Testament studies with my master's. And my intent was to be a professor of New Testament studies. But I got, it got derailed, and I ended up in the ministry and preaching through the Bible, you know, the 30 years I was in the ministry. So, uh, yeah, it just was uh, central. It was very central to my, my life and my faith and everything. That, mm -hmm. that was the... I compare it to a, a Jenga block tower. My whole tower of belief and faith and Christianity rested on the Bible. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And you were raised, were you raised in the church then as well? Uh, in a Christian home and um, the church now and then, sort of sporadically when I was a child. And uh, we weren't devoted to any one denomination, but we moved around because um, my dad was transferred a lot. Um, and then when I was in my teens, finally settled down in a Pentecostal church. Okay. Yeah. That's amazing. It is. <laughs> but you wrote in one of your posts about the theological anguish you experienced. Mm -hmm. I thought my choice was accept everyone and reject the Bible or accept the Bible and reject everyone. And this is something, I mean, I hear this all the time as well, like this very dualistic thinking. It has to be yeah. or this, all that or nothing of that. And yeah. I, Sometimes I find it funny because I'll get the comment a lot, like, you're cherry picking the Bible, but then you, you know, I'll respond at times and say, like, 
well, how are your animal sacrifices going? And they're like, oh, <laughs> New Testament. And I'm like, okay, so we completely disregard 39. We cherry pick the, no, you know, we leave yeah. the nine yeah. Old Testament and cherry pick the new. So anyway, I want you to talk about that. Like, mm -hmm. why, why do you think that there's such a prominent narrative that it has to be all or nothing? Yeah. Well, that's just the, the kind of Christianity I was raised in. And most religions are this way. Uh, I'm not just being, I'm not being judgmental. It's just a fact of life that religions do believe that they're the best way and have the best answer and have the most insight and the most profound vision and revelation of what is true. And, and, and so Christianity is no different than any other religion that way that believes, you know, its way is the way it, it has the truth. And, and every religion has their holy books and scriptures. And, and so I grew up in that kind of context that um, this is what's right. And my, my upbringing was kind of in a more conservative, you know, bent. And, and uh, so its interpretation of scripture was more conservative. You know, you needed to be born again and, uh, you know, uh, the patriarchy and, yes. you know, sexism and, and uh, LGBT, uh, LGBTQIA reality and, mm -hmm. you know, all that thing was very much determined by the religious context I was in. So, yeah, the, the, the Bible, it all came as a piece, mm -hmm. you know, my, my religious upbringing and the Bible and everything. It's, it's kind of a, a vicious circle of confirmation bias when you're inside that right, yeah. where your, your beliefs are confirmed by scripture, and then the scripture solidifies your beliefs, which confirms scripture, and it's just like, and then you hang around with other people that feel the same way, and you hire preachers that preach the same way, and there you have it, you're stuck. Right. right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, you say that something happened in 2009. That yeah. You, what happened? What that thing well, I, the anguish I was experiencing was, um, and I was a pastor at the time, was, uh, and the movement I was in at the time, the Vineyard, was struggling with LGBTQIA and all that. And, anything. and unfortunately, a couple of years ago, it came out uh, as non-affirming. Okay. Um, but uh, I'd left before then. I could see it coming. Now, that was one of the big issues for me was, how do I reconcile what I feel in my heart is true mm. that we're all, you know, that all, all are loved and all are included and we're all one and connected. And, and, and uh, how do I reconcile that sense I have with what I've been raised on? Right. So that was the conflict. And the conflict was so heated that in 2009, I was ready to throw in the towel on the ministry and everything. Like I was just going to walk away from everything. It's like, that's it. I give up. Um, trying to reconcile this. I'm just going to go with loving everybody and, and, you know, heck with the Bible kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, but in 2009, I had this profound kind of epiphany where I, I was kind of in and out. Of, like, I think I might've lied down for a nap or something. And it was just like, I saw this vision of a waterfall and, um, I could see, I could see everybody around it with their own different perspectives and all that. I don't want to get into it. It's a long story. But what I came out of that was I immediately felt peace of mind, mm. profound peace of mind, and it's never left. And, and it, at the root of this epiphany I had, I don't know what to call it, was this profound sense that we're all connected and deeply mm. united on a fundamental level. And it's confirmed by, you know, quantum physics and, you know, mystical theologians and other mystics and, you know, Eastern philosophy and all that, this deep sense of oneness, the oneness of all things, the all that is in all, the reconciliation of all things and, you know, all this kind of thing. And I, I just felt that, that, that that's it. Yeah. That, it was resolved. I just knew and felt and sensed this oneness and immediately I had this peace of mind. So I started to share people, share with people, maybe naively, uh, because I was a pastor at that time. I was sharing with people what I discovered and that within a year I was, I, I basically had to leave the ministry. <laughs> you were polite to boot it out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, we are all one. Yeah. Is 
what are we one within? Is Are we one within love? Are we one within God? Like, how do you articulate what we're one within? Yeah, well, it's, 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 the, it's the oneness. And, and yeah, we can call it love. Um, you know, it doesn't, I don't necessarily have to feel any emotion with it. Mm -hmm. I, I just felt this peace come over me, this peace of mind that the, the, the struggle was gone. It was immediate. This peace came over my mind. It wasn't achieved through thought. It was this sense, I guess, experience of oneness with all things that can't be, you know, nobody can talk me out of it. It's, it's just, I just, just this profound sense. And, and to know that we all share this one reality. We all share this one reality, but we all have our own thoughts and words that we use to try to comprehend it and articulate this reality. That's where the difference seems to be, is in our thoughts and words, but it's not in our essential connectedness. Yes. So, so yeah, it feels like it feels loving and accepting and inclusive and non-judgmental mm -hmm. and, and all those things. It feels like all that. And, and um, it's, it's, it's without malice. There's no division. It's just mm -hmm. peace. Yeah. I'm, I'm sounding kind of weird the way I'm talking about this. No, it's not. You're <laughs> Really, really, truly not. I was raised in a very conservative evangelical dad as an evangelical pastor. Very gracious man. I'm so grateful for my upbringing on so many levels. Mm -hmm. When I had my third child, my littlest daughter, my kind of moment of awakening when everything started to you use the word deconstruct for me was I was holding her in my arms and I was about to go on tour. And I was feeling really overwhelmed and she was only a few months old. And I'm like, what am I doing with my life? You know, I started reading all of these books that I had always relied upon, Christian books, um, all of them kind of geared towards women. And they all had the same idea of like reading the Bible and going to church and having a family and, uh, you know, ministering to one another. And I, I looked at my daughter, who's an infant, and I thought, oh my goodness, according to these books, you don't have any purpose yet. No reason for you to even be here. You can't read. What if you're never able to read? What if you don't want to have children? What if you're unable to have children? What if you have a child and lose it tragically? Like, so everything started to crumble. Like, oh my goodness, why are we here if not? Um, yeah for something greater than, a, you know, fulfilling these various roles. And so from, for me, from that moment forward, it was like, okay, I'm yeah. reconsidering now, reconsidering now why I'm here and what I've been told. It was Walt Whitman's quote kind of ruined me when he said, re-examine all you have learned in every book and in church and in every school setting, because I began to just think about, you know, everything I told and the LGBTQ community was in line with that because I had been told and believed for my whole life that they were living in sin and that they were outcast from God and separate from God. And yeah. so the, there is a very real um, unlearning that has to take place when you- That's, that's deconstruction. Yeah. Yes, it is. Tell us about that. Tell us about, because there's like a grief that goes along with it. There's a liberation that goes along with it. There's this moment that you're speaking of where it's like, Oh my goodness! Yeah. No, we're we're meant to be who we are. The LGBTQI yeah. is meant. They're created in the image of God. Like this is yeah. not you know. Yeah. This is not told. Yeah, it's it's interesting to me what what um, experiences people share that changes their life, like you with your daughter. Um, with me, it I, um, it was I lied down on my bed to have a a little nap because I was exhausted and I had this sort of picture of a waterfall that was moment, just took a moment, but it changed my life forever. Mm. Or uh, I read a book that made me look at scripture differently. Or um, I, I met some uh, gay guys, uh, my wife and I and another couple of friends, we met some gay guys who uh, in a hot tub at a hotel and we started talking 
And when one of them found out I was a pastor, he left. And yep. the other guy said, listen, he's really upset about pastors and the church because of the way we've been abused and everything. And they lost, they were kicked out of church. They lost their jobs. The oil company wouldn't deliver furnace fuel to their home, et cetera, et cetera. And I was sitting there aghast. I couldn't believe the abuse and the suffering and the struggle that these guys had suffered for, for being gay. Yeah. And that's what changed. It's like, okay, this, this isn't working. This isn't working. This mm -hmm. whole love the sin, hate the sinner thing and all that kind of stuff, that mm -hmm. garbage, it's not working. And, the, and, the, and I had to figure this out. It took a long time, but it, that, it came to me in that, that picture of the waterfall that we're all, yeah, we're all one. I'm yeah. one with those gay guys. They're one with me. We're all connected. Our gender, sexuality, all that kind of thing are just like, you know, things. But the, a deep fundamental level, we're, we're one. We're united. We're bonded. And uh, that's, that settled it for me. But, yeah, deconstruction as questioning everything. Uh, and I, I'm talking about this a lot lately because a lot of people are mistaking deconstruction for just changing their mind. I'm, uh, that's it, I. I, I'm, I'm going to stop going to church or uh, I'm no longer going to believe in uh, six day creation or whatever. And uh, I'm like, well, I think real deconstruction is a lifetime of constantly questioning what you've been being fed, um, what you've inherited, um, what you've adopted, what you believe, um, the status quo. Uh, the way things are, the way, you know, all this stuff we're constantly questioned. So for me, it's a lifestyle. It's something I'll always be doing, questioning everything. It's like one of my books, Questions Are the Answer. It's yeah. not like questions lead to an answer. I'm saying questions actually are where we should be living mm -hmm. and, and living in that mystery and the profoundness of, of, of the universe and the wonder of it all. Um, that's where the peace is. It's not um, through analytics or you know rational answers so that's why fund uh, uh deconstruction yeah it's traumatic but uh especially at first mm -hmm. but af after a while you get used to it it's yeah. like this is kind of cool you know this is the, the way i want to live my life yes right mm. well and i think as it concerns faith in the church context and specifically the lgbtq community like, mm -hmm. I was, I was raised for lack of a better way of saying it. Just don't ask the question. Like, don't say the thing that's going to question the thing. Just say it. Right. And especially like you're a girl, so you need to be quiet. <laughs> like, we're not going to say, <laughs> I am no longer the woman that does not say the thing, you know? <laughs> no, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> <laughs> we were told that like our curiosity was wrong or out of alignment with God and and I think that this is where we've sort of, we've definitely lost our way, the damage and the abuse that the church has caused, that the American evangelical church has caused. Yeah. The Q community is devastating and horrific and it must, it must change. Like it yeah. must, and I have yeah. to say that it's possible. Me too. Do you believe that it's possible that the yeah, church- Yeah, you have to. You have to believe. See, I'm because of the that thing where I, I know we're connected and, and one at a deep and fundamental, that includes homophobes and a gay person. Mm -hmm. They're one. Mm -hmm. I don't believe I have to fight for unity. I have to I believe I have to fight to help people see that we're already one. Mm -hmm. We're already connected. It's not a I don't have to try to bond us or connect us or unite us or whatever we already are united so the way i'm coming at it is the only way i think that is fruitful and helpful and that is look we're already one it's just your stupid ideas that mm -hmm. are separating us and, and and makes you think that we're divided and different um and we're fear. we're yeah so we're we're deeply deeply connected and that's why i draw the cartoons and and the art that i do because my hope is that, um, oh, so, so many wonderful comments. Um, my hope is that one of these cartoons are going to snap somebody's thinking yes. and, and change. And in fact, I know they do. I get messages from people. Oh, my God, that's, you totally changed my mind. 
Yeah. And this cartoon totally showed me what I was doing, you know. Yeah. And uh, so that's why I do what I do. Because I'm, I am, I, I, I'm not hoping that I can convince everybody that, you know, we need to get along. Mm -hmm. my, my hope is that I'm already working with something that already exists. I just have to convince other people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My children that to think of God as a massive puzzle and like mm -hmm. God has fractioned God's self into billions of different puzzle pieces. And so collectively we bear Imago Dei, we bear a, a collectively an image of God where, you know, your puzzle piece, your yeah. art, your creativity, your natural proclivities, the way that you love who you love, that is so like intrinsic to oneself given mm -hmm. God imprinted upon you. And so to be anything other than what God has created you to be, mm -hmm. especially for other people to assert their convictions upon another individual saying, Oh, no, 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 you're less than, or no, 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 you can't love who you love because X, Y, and Z, then that, that refuses them the opportunity to be the very piece of the puzzle that is going to display to the world the image of God. And so right. it's not, there's a degree, and I, agree, I do agree with you that there's a degree of like, we are already one. I do believe that. I do believe that there can be unity without requiring a uniformity of thought. Absolutely. But I, I also know that we, we still have a long way to go. You know, there are mm -hmm. seven states that um, don't prohibit discrimination yeah. on sexual orientation or gender identity in the United States. 27 yeah. states that still don't prohibit it. That's, yeah, it's a lot. Completely archaic to me. Um, so well, let's look at your analogy of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. If we accept that the puzzle as it is, it all fits into place. It, yeah. There's difficulty trying to figure out, and some of them are upside down. We have to turn them up, you know. But eventually, you figure it out. I feel that people who are going, like who are going against LGBTQIA and you know um, promote sexism or even misogyny and spiritual abuse, I feel they're like this with the puzzle pieces, yeah. trying to make them fit. Yeah. And and you can see the. Uh, anger and the frustration and the unnaturalness of it and um how i believe i we we do fit we all fit just let us all fall into our place let us be who we are you be your authentic brilliant self juliana i'll be my self and we we fit together beautifully yes. um rather than you know holding on to hate or or discrimination or, you know, being judgmental or exclusive or all these things, I think it's forcing something um, that, that isn't natural. Yeah, I agree. Um, one of my favorite art pieces that you've done, which if I could turn around my thing, I have it right behind me <laughs> on my wall. Oh, the collage? Yes, the collage of all the Jesuses. <laughs> you have um, Jesus holding the rainbow wedding cake. And I wanted to ask, is this from the Supreme Court case in 2018? Okay, I thought, okay, the Masterpiece Cake Shop versus the Colorado Civil Rights Commission. That's the one. That's the one, okay. That's the one. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so, yeah, so I, I, I was so upset over that because, so I drew a picture. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of, like you said, I'm kind of ballsy, I kind of, go out on a limb and, and I can say something very forthrightly. So um, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Sometimes the picture is worth a thousand sermons. And uh, so I, I drew this picture of Jesus really enjoying with ice yeah. icing on his lips and everything, really enjoying a piece of rainbow cake mm -hmm. and offering it to us to partake. And my goodness, that upset so many people. And I still can't believe there are people who actually believe that uh, a, a, a business that's there to serve the public can refuse service to a people group. I'm like, would you say it's okay for them to refuse business to a Muslim right. couple or, or to uh, a black person? Yes, I do. 
I'm like, okay, man, you're, you're, <laughs> something's got to drag you into this century because, you know, that's just uh, abominable in my opinion. So it's always so conveniently. Yeah. Orientation or their race or their ability that's being, you know, yeah. communicated and oppressed. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Tell us more though about like using your art to, to it, art is so, it's so powerful. Like you mm -hmm. said, it does say mm -hmm. many more words than I could ever articulate, but yeah. you, you communicate your messages of faith, of equality, of love. And mm -hmm. so what's next for you? <laughs> well, you're an artist too, right? I mean, uh, even with your, your, I love your pictures. And if anybody's not following Juliana, you, you got to follow her because your pictures are just so happy and uh, full of color. And that's just art to me. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it was back in 2006, so I'd started my blog, Naked Pastor, uh, which basically means me being honest and vulnerable. I wanted people to see behind the curtain of what a real pastor's life was like. You know, not the great sermons and the wonderful worship and the huge offerings and the church growth and converts and all that. I wanted them to see that I struggle with my finances and there's conflict and sometimes uh, worship is sucks. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, Lisa and I fight. Sometimes our kids are naughty, you know, all this kind of thing. Sometimes we lose people, betrayal, all that stuff. And so that's why I call it Naked Pastor. And so I was just writing about that. But then one day I, I was, I really love a good cartoon, like a one frame cartoon, like the New Yorker or something like that. And I, I thought, you know what, I'm going to try a cartoon. And so I tried a cartoon one day and the response was unbelievable. And so I thought, well, this is a lot more fun than writing. So I, uh, I just started, I, I dared myself to try a cartoon every day until I ran out of ideas. I thought I'd last a month and here I am 16 years later still drawing cartoons. Because they just, I love the power and the immediacy and the effectiveness of them. Like, so if somebody totally hates what I do, but they see one of my cartoons, they can't unsee it. It's too late. It's in their head. Mm -hmm. And I just love that power. They, if they come to a blog post of mine and read it, they, they can read the first sentence and say, oh, I don't agree with that and swipe on and or, or, or just ignore it or whatever. But with a cartoon, it's too late. You can't unsee it. It's inside your head. I don't love that. I love that. <laughs> and my cartoons are, they just reach a lot of people and either really encourage them or really upset them, one or the other. And uh, so that's why I, I do what I do. And I keep trying to figure out new ways of creating art that reflects what I'm, what I'm passionate about and my, my vision of the world and um, people and community and church and belief and all those things. So I try and, uh, so, you know, I've drawn, drawn a lot of cartoons that, you know, aren't any good. And I've drawn a few good ones. <laughs> you drew you so many good ones. I love <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I do. I really do. I look forward to all of them. <laughs> so. <laughs> what would you say from your perspective because you are a natural leader here you really are I think oh so, well thank you so safe with you oh, um, like there's yeah that's important yeah it really is and you do a really beautiful and I know intentional job of being a safe person I mean I think one of the first times I reached out to you I was like way too personal than I needed to be <laughs> No, like, hey, I'm struggling. <laughs> no, you're my kind of people. No, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. But let's let's get right to it. Yeah. I know it's so true. It is so true. And you have you are that person for so many of our thank you of our thank LGBT you friends. So I wanted to ask you from your perspective, what is what's another way that we can become better allies to our LGBTQ community? especially while we're in this conversation of, you know, right. and like what can we do to be better allies? I think the thing for me that's really hot right now, and in fact, I did a cartoon of this yesterday where um, a rainbow sheep uh, is standing in front of a flock of white sheep. And one of the white sheep says, and white just means just a flock of sheep. I don't, I'm not talking about race. Mm -hmm. um, so the rainbow sheep uh, and a, a flock of sheep, regular sheep. And the, uh, 
one of the sheep says, look, I'd love to support you, but I've got all these other relationships to consider. Mm. And so that tension, you know, it's one thing for, a, say, a gay or a trans person to come out. That's terrifying. Uh, there's a lot of risk. Uh, the courage that it takes, I can't even imagine. Yes. But then we as friends have our own risks to take mm. and courage to muster mm. to support them publicly. It hurts them if we remain silent. Yes. And uh, it, it, it uh, damages any progress that they might make if we don't stand up and, and speak and support and befriend uh, them. And uh, so I know, I remember the first time when I actually had to sort of come out in support of LGBTQIA folk. Um, I knew the risks involved. Mm -hmm. I knew I might lose friends, family, and whatever. And I know a lot of people wouldn't agree with me, but my thinking was my gay friend took that risk and actually lost his family and his support and had to create a new family and new friends. He took that risk just to be who he is. That, that's the least I can do, right? To, is to, to say, I support my friend. Yeah. And um, that, that to me, I think is a hot issue right now. And I think, I think eventually this is what's going to change the church. Yes. Um, is when people start standing up and saying, listen, if we can't be affirming, totally affirming, mm -hmm. um, level playing field, equal opportunity, everything for the LGBTQIA, leave, we're leaving. Yes. That would change the church's mind. Yes. And people are. People and are. they are. People That's are right. tired of it. Tired yeah. of trying to justify hatred by, I like to call it, God frosting, just slathering it, like, <laughs> and the languaging, you're yeah. affirming, like the double, yeah. I'm like, you don't get to like have a free pass here. You are either for the equality of individuals or you are against the equality of individuals. This is not a complicated question. No, no. This is a simple yeah. issue of human dignity and value and we're, so I'm, I am with you 100%. All of the people that are watching and have this, don't stay silent. Do not right. be silent. That is, that's just as damaging. It really is because your silence says a million, <laughs> says a million. Yeah. You, you know, one of, one of my most controversial cartoons is where um, there's two frames, which is unusual for me, but there's a bunch of sheep in a church and Jesus is with them. And a rainbow sheep comes to the door and the other sheep say, sorry, but you're not welcome here. And the next frame, Jesus leaves with the rainbow sheep. Yes. And the other sheep say, where'd Jesus go? Mm -hmm. That upsets so many people because I think for me, that draws out the something that's happening for too long. People in the center assume that, their God and Jesus is with them mm -hmm. and always will be no matter, you know, if they sin or they make mistakes, they'll, you know, or they're, they're given time and God is patient and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. But what if, what if Jesus isn't in the center? Mm -hmm. What if he's on the margins? Mm -hmm. What if he's in the wilderness? What, what if he's with the prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners? Yeah. What if he's there? Yes. And I'm not comparing LGBTQ to sinners. I'm talking about marginalized people. And, and uh, that, when, when you draw a picture of that, mm -hmm. it really upsets people. Yeah. yeah. And good. It's too graphic. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> you cannot hold on to both. You know, there's an intellectual decision that has to be made. Which yes. I'm so frustrated at like all are welcome, but then they're not allowed to lead or, you know, they, they don't have any one of color leading or they don't have a gay or a lesbian or a trans leading or they're not allowed to teach Sunday school. And it's like, you're not welcoming. You, you can't just mask it in that. Right, right. It, and it's kind of like back to the idea of being one, you know, if, mm -hmm. if we talk about the body, if all of a sudden the brain was like, you know what? I really 
and jealous of the heart, I'm going to start pumping blood. Like that's not going to go well for us. <laughs> yeah. If I'm yeah, it's true. Super jealous of the eardrums. That's not going to go well for us either. Like we <laughs> are intended to be exactly who we are. And there is so much freedom to anyone yeah. listening. Who's like, I don't know. I'm still wrestling with the Bible. Number one, pick up this book. Number mm -hmm. two, follow naked pastor, but also just consider that, that the image of God is so huge and that we each have been given a part to play and not one is better or less than the other. We are here to love and we are here to communicate yeah. another. Yeah. I want to thank, there's so many people giving really good, encouraging comments. And I just want to thank everybody for those. It's very sweet. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, I, I, I appreciate the work you're doing too. And, um, there's so many other people doing the work mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I know I'm, I know my art's out there and I'm doing my, my little bit, but it really, um, there's a whole bunch of voices crying in the, in the wilderness. Right. And, um, a whole lot of little John the Baptist everywhere. But I think that voices are getting louder and there's more and more of them. I think so. And yeah, I'm encouraged by that. Yes, me too. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for being a voice that we can all look at and listen. And um, it really Thank is you. such an honor. Thank you. Thank you and consider you a friend. Yeah, I consider you a friend as well. Thank you so much. Thanks. It's been fun. Bye, everyone. Thanks Bye, everybody. Love y'all. <laughs> Bye.